Okay, the reading for this week is uh, one of the most important uh, works of literary criticism uh, written during the 20th century, and it is by Ishikawa Jun, and the title of the essay is Edojin no Hasso Ho Nitsuite, translated by me as On the Thought Patterns of the People of Edo. And it was first published at the height of the Second World War in the March 1943 issue of the journal Shiso. And in this video, I will be reading a brief introduction to the work, along with the 17 questions that are on your study guide uh, that sort of force you to delve deeply into the work and to think about what's going on in this essay. And then I will turn the microphone over to my assistant, Nicole, and she will do a mellifluous, as always, reading of my translation of the essay, which is only maybe eight or nine pages in the PDF file that you have, but it is extremely dense. And there are copious footnotes that I have included in my translation. We will not be reading those. Those will be included, of course, in my forthcoming tome, which is called Writing Beyond Realism, Ishikawa's Case Against Modern Japanese Literature. And we see that sort of fundamental uh, critique of modern Japanese literature in this essay as well. And I discussed this essay in chapter seven of my uh, forthcoming tome. All right, so published in 1943 at the height of the war. Now it is widely considered a classic of modern Japanese literary criticism. The essay was recently include, included in the second volume of Chiba Shunji, my former advisor at Waseda University. Chiba Shunji and Tsubo Yuzo's influential anthology of literary criticism called Nihon Kindai Bungaku Hyoron Sen, the Showa Hen, an anthology of modern Japanese literary criticism, Showa period, which came out in 2004. It's included in that very important work, which uh, sort of sparked a renewed interest in the essay. As I argue, and that was my first um, sort of introduction to this essay as well, uh, coming across it at Waseda University when I was taking Shu Chibat Sensei's class. As I argue in chapter seven of my tome, this essay, despite its title, an explicit subject, namely the thought patterns of the people of Edo, despite that, it is much more than an, an exquisite treatise on the haikai literature of the Edo period as critic Noguchi Takehiko described it. More importantly, it is an incisive, if oblique, attack on what Ishikawa regarded as the founding notion and dominant paradigm of modern Japanese literature, namely Shajitsu Shugi. Underline this word, Shajitsu Shugi, I talk about it all the time. It's sort of the main subject of my tome, Shajitsu Shugi, uh, which is translated as the system of copying reality, which is kind of the fundamental premise of most of modern Japanese literature. While the essay is explicit, so the target of this, this essay is this notion of Shajitsu Shugi, which became the sort of fundamental uh, notion of modern Japanese literature. While the essay's explicit subject is the dominant thought patterns, or Hasoho, as he calls them, or literary hermeneutic paradigm of the Edo period, that's the explicit subject. The implicit subject of this essay is the dominant thought patterns or literary hermeneutic paradigm of modernity. Right. So uh, we want to separate the content of the explicit content of the work and the implicit content of modernity by invoking the largely forgotten literary techniques of the Edo period, namely mitate. These are very key words that appear in the essay. I underline them now so you uh, keep your eyes open for them as they appear in the, in the essay. Mitate, or analog parody, as I translate that as. Zokuka, or popularization or vernacularization. Yatsushi, lowly disguise, for example, when Genji... Uh, Hikaru Genji of Genji Monogate dresses like a commoner and goes into the city to mingle with the common women and so forth. That's called Yatsushi. Uh, honkadori is another key word, the elusive variation on a native waka poem. Honshidori, which is uh, a word that uh, uh, Ishikawa coins in this essay, kind of play on the word honkadori, except for Chinese poems. So it's an elusive variation in Sinitic poems, honshidori. So these and other uh, key terms appear in this work, and he, he gathers these all together and calls them the five conversion devices, the tenkan no sosa, of haikai transformation, or haikai ka. So by doing all of this, by invoking these largely forgotten techniques, Ishikawa sought to show his readers that alternatives to mimetic realism, or, or shajitsugi, existed in the past and could still be mobilized in the creation of new modes of writing. Although Ishikawa does not idealize or romanticize the Edo period and the Edo, Edoites, as many of his contemporaries did. Think, for example, of Tanizaki uh, in his, oh, his debut work, uh, Shisei, for example, or Nagai Kafu's works that uh, romanticize or idealize the Edo period. So uh, Ishikawa does not do that. 
He does, however, depict its literary culture in thoroughly positive terms, implicitly contrasting it with the disenchanted modern world that has lost the ability to see, to read, and to understand the world analogically. So this analogical imagination, as I call it, is a hallmark of the Edo period literature. As we read the essay, we should keep in mind that his description of this past tradition is, in fact, a coded critique of the present. Okay, that's the introductory blurb. Now on to the uh, 17 <laughs> questions on your study guide. And haikai, I just use that word haikai. In order to understand this essay, you will need to know what haikai is. So we'll discuss this in class. For your homework, look up the uh, haikai bungaku of the Edo period and figure out what haikai is referring to. Study guide, number one. I'm going to go this, through this very quickly so we can get to the recitation so Nicole doesn't get too bored. What significance does Ishikawa see in the popular Edo legend, the tale of the maid servant Otake, Hijo Otake no Setsu? What is the significance of this uh, legend for him? What are the ur, ur texts or precursor texts for this legend and the accompanying Sendyu poem that appears at the very opening of the essay? What does Ishikawa mean when he says it's the novel idea of transforming some lowly Sakuma housemaid into the Dainichi Nyorai, what never would have occurred to anyone had the no play Eguchi and the popular tales about Saigyo from the uh, 12th century, the great monk poet, uh, and courtesan Eguchi not preceded it? Okay, that's question number one. Number two. Ishikawa identifies in this essay, as I mentioned in the introductory blurb, five transformative devices, or tenka no sosa, as he calls them, that make up the process of haikai ka, or haikaiification. Haikaiification, as I translate that. A process he sees is running through all art forms of the Edo period, not just literature, but visual arts as well. They're based on this idea of haikai ka, of taking from something from lofty culture, from the canonical past, from ancient antiquity, from Tang dynasty poetry and so forth, and lowering it to the uh, level of the commoner so that it becomes part of the popular culture of the age. All right, so he identifies in this essay five transformative devices that he sees running through all forms of art of the Edo period. The first device he identifies is mitate. Mitate is a very important word in uh, Edo period. Visual art, for example. Explain this concept or this technique. How does it function in the otake legend? How does this technique connect the Edo era maid otake to the famed prostitute of antiquity, Lady Eguchi, or, or courtesan Eguchi, Eguchi no Kimi, and also the young wandering rake who solicits sexual services from otake to that old itinerant monk Saigyo. So the young rake who goes looking for Eguchi, or goes looking for Otake, is compared or sort of corresponds to the old itinerant monk Saigyo. So how is this um, technique or um, conceit of mitate working in this work? Number three, Ishikawa believes that modern man has lost the ability to understand and appreciate this tale about the maidservant Otake and other haikai narratives. Explain his reasons for thinking this. So why does he think that modernity, modern um, Japanese is specifically, have lost this ability to make connections with the uh, distant past? Number four, the second transformative device, or tenka no sosa, that I, Ishikawa identifies is zokka, which I translate as secularization, vulgarization. Explain this concept or technique. How does zokka operate in the otake legend? What does Ishikawa mean when he says the Edoites were much more adept at vulgarizing or secularizing zokka in ideas than they were at excogitating them? Number five. The third transformative device Ishikawa discusses is yatsushi, or lowly disguise. Explain this notion or technique. What does Ishikawa mean when he says that otake is the yatsushi version of the dainichi nyorai, and that otake legend itself is the yatsushi version of the Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination. Number six, why does Ishikawa think that it is, it is the Edoites, he writes, and not, as most scholars assume, their descendants, who truly deserve the label of modern? Discuss the so-called modern qualities that Ishikawa sees in the Edoites, but finds lacking in his own time. So he kind of identifies an alternative modernity that could have taken place but didn't, in this uh, sort of analogical imagination of the early modern Japanese. Number seven, 
Most literary, literary histories explain the transition from Matsuo Basho's haikai to Ota Nampo's Kyoka Kyoshi as a decline in the haikai movement. Ishikawa, however, challenges this history by insisting that the Tenmei Kyoka movement was in fact the ultimate expression of the haikai spirit. Hai-i is the word for haikai spirit, the hai-i. Why does he think this? Okay, so what does he find? In the poetry, the Kyoka and the Kyoshi of Nampo and other writers of the Tenmei period in the 1780s, as the ultimate, why does he find this to be the ultimate expression of the haikai spirit that began with Matsubasho and so forth? Number eight, the fourth transformative device Ishikawa describes is honkadori, elusive variation. This is a very uh, common device in classical Japanese literature, especially poetry, uh, but specifically in poetry. Some of you have already uh, encountered this worm in our work, this idea in our other readings. What does Ishikawa say about this notion or technique? How did Ota Nampo and others revolutionize the practice of honkadori in their collection, uh, the Manzai Kyokashu, the wild poems of the 10,000 generations with the, which they compiled and put out in 1783? Right, so this technique of honkadori had existed for centuries, but according to Ishika, Ota Nampo and the other uh, Edo poets, they revolutionized this technique. How did they do so? Number nine, according to Ishikawa, Matsuo Obasho made a revolutionary discovery in the Genroku period that paved the way for further inventions and innovations, or Hatsume as he calls them, in the Tenmei era. What was this, this discovery? How did the Tenmei Kyoka poets inherit or build on this discovery? Number 10, Ishikawa describes the Tenmei poets as, quote, absent from their sob sobriquet, sobriquet, <laughs> their kyomyo, their pen names or aliases. In other words, he continues, they were anonymous personas, writing yomibito shirazu, or anonymous poems. The haikai linked verse of Basho, he continues, made us forget the presence of the author the moment of its formation. Yet the pi compilers of wild poems took this one step further by erecting a whole world from this renunciation of authorial name. End quote. Discuss the significance of this passage. How is this notion of erecting a whole world from the renunciation of authorial name radically different from the credo of most modern writers and modern poets, where the chief purpose of um, writing poetry is self-expression, of, of showing your inner self, a true self, and so forth. According to Ishikawa, the uh, Edo poets from Matsuo Basho on through Nampo, uh, Ota Nampo and the Tenmei poets uh, had a very different idea of what it means to write poetry and to create art. Explain these differences is that question. Number 11. Ishikawa asserts that all modern hermeneutic modes completely miss the point of haikai. What are his reasons for thinking this? Why does Ishikawa regard mimetic modes, modes of reading and writing as inadequate for understanding and appreciating the haikai imagination? To borrow Haro Shirane's phrase, what alternative mode of reading is required to understand the haikai imagination? Number 12, what classical anthology served as the basis or the urtext for Ota Nampo's wild poems of 10,000 generations. Why was this particular anthology used? So what did they find in this very important uh, classical anthology of poetry? Um, what did they find in it that related to their own lives in the Edo period, and why did they use that as the basis for building their own poetic new tradition? Number 13, the fifth transformative device, or Tenka no Sosa, that Ishika discusses in is his neologism, Hon Shi Dori. Discuss this concept or technique. What anthology of Chinese poetry served as the basis or the urtext for their kyoshi? Wild Chinese Sinitic poems. Wild Sinitic, Sinitic poems. Explain the relation between this anthology and its genkai. It's another important word that appears in the essay. Colloquial uh, explanations, or it's more like a, a vernacular rendition of the earlier Chinese poem. It's, it's called genkai. How does Ota Nampo parody Wang Changling's Tang Dynasty poem, Parting with Xinjiang at Hibiscus Inn? What negotiations, as Ishikawa puts it, Kosho, another key term in this essay, what negotiations occur between poet-reader, past and present, in this poem? Number 14. Consider the following passage from the essay. What does he mean by invention or innovation, Hatsume? How is the critical standard of Hatsume different from the critical standard of craftsmanship? Which does Ishikawa prefer? So according to him, the, I, the uh, purpose of the writer is not creation from nothing, or, and it's not simply craftsmanship alone, but it's something that he calls 
invention or innovation, and it has to do with uh, relation to the um, tradition, uh, the previous tradi literary tradition. By evaluating Edo poems, he writes, capriciously and in isolation, we remove ourselves from that ur original urgency which characterized the Tenmei Edoite method of reading. The genius of Tenmei Kyoshi was articulated through innovation, invention, Hatsume. Hence, it would be foolish to jump headlong into a debate about craftsmanship in Kyoshi, which, unlike the native art of Kyoka, is derived from Chinese poetry. So his basic point here is that you can't just have uh, Kyoshi uh, from the 1780s in front of you and analyze that poem in isolation from the entire tradition. It can only be in, understood in the context of the Tang Dynasty po poems, uh, the tradition, how it's interacting with that tradition, and so forth. So they must be read in a broader cultural context. They can't be just uh, analyzed, uh, analyzed f uh, using uh, methods of close reading, for example, that we see with the uh, new critics of the 20th century. That new critical method of close reading does not work in the case of these Kyoshi poems and Kyoka poems of the Edo period. This is point there. Number 15, Ishikawa cites an episode from Santo Kyoden Sharebon. Sharebon is a very important gesaku genre uh, from the Edo period. We'll talk about the Sharebon in uh, books of wit. It's sometimes translated as kind of manuals for men who are both erudite and have this knowledge of classical literature, but also enjoy uh, prostitutes and going to hang out in the uh, Demi Monde, the Yukaku district, and so forth. Um, this, that genre is called the Sharebon. Santo Kyoden is the, one of the most famous uh, practitioners of the Sharebon. Ishikawa cites an episode from Kyoden's Shige Shige Chiwa, 1799, in which the author refashions a poem from uh, the Tang Dynasty collection, uh, selection of Tang poems by Tsui Guofu, a very sad and melancholy, melancholy poem, and Santo Kyoden refashions that into a humorous contemporary poem about a client at a brothel. Describe the similarities and differences between the two poems. How does the new version reflect the genkai, or the colloquial uh, renditions, of the selection of tang, tang, tang poems, which was popular at the time? Number 16, haikai ka, as I mentioned above, uh, haikaiization, is built on the interplay between shuko, or twist, innovation, device, and sekai. These are two very, very important terms in the context of all Edo period culture, shuko and sekai, underline these, we'll discuss them in class. Shuko is twist, innovation, or device that the author uses to uh, make a kind of um, interesting uh, shift from the original text. And sekai is the original thematic base or the classical setting from which the author is drawing. This interplay or reflame, reframing between the shuko and the sek sekai is only effective if the audience or the readers are familiar with the original sekai the original classical setting, the thematic base. How does Ishikawa describe the importance of cultural literacy and familiarity in the medium of haikai? What has happened to this cultural literacy in the modern period? And I'll give you a hint, it basically disappears, which is one of Ishikawa's main complaints. So the world disappears. The sekai, this uh, classical setting or thematic base that had been the sort of ground for the Japanese literary and cultural imagination for centuries, uh, more or less disappears in the modern period, and um, Ishka laments that disappearance. We have this de-worlding of the world in modernity, which of course is something that Heidegger, for example, writes about. It's not something uh, that happens only in Japan. It happens everywhere, uh, Europe included in modernity. And the final question, although the explicit subject of this essay is the thought patterns of the people of Edo, its implicit subject is the thought patterns of the modern age. Explain how this essay is a disguised critique of the dominant aesthetic and hermeneutical modes of modernity. How does the framework of haikaika, haikaiization, serve for Ishka as one possible alternative to these dominant modes? All right. And we can, of course, consider our last question in the context of Ishikawa's fiction of the period of the 1930s and 40s and so forth, and see how he uh, sort of develops this idea that he theorizes in this essay in his own fiction and kind of uses it as a mode or a paradigm for uh, creating new works of fiction that kind of interact with the tradition. All right, those are all the questions for me. 17 questions, a lot to go over. We'll probably spend three months on this essay because it's so dense and there's so much to do. And now I will turn the microphone over to Nicole and she will read 
the essay, my translation of the essay. Okay, here you go. Sakuma serving girl, gold leaf, curly hair, all a frizzle. Come knocking on her back door, she is told she rode out on an elephant the day before last. I'm not sure how ethnographers and folklorists handle the popular Edo folk tale about Otake Dainichi Nyorai. It seems the legend is usually linked with the story of a temple saint or with some cautionary maxim about not wasting rice gains in the kitchen sink. But whatever strange socio-historical factors preserve this particular Buddha story, the novel conceit Juko. of transforming this lowly maid to the Sakuma household into an avatar of the highest divinity in esoteric Buddhism, the Dainichi Nyorai, never would have occurred to anyone at the 14th century no play by Kanami, Eguchi, and before that, the 10th century popular tales about the monk Saigyo and the prostitute of Eguchi had not preceded it. You see, the legend about a common prostitute from the town of Eguchi named Tae, who was suddenly transformed into the Fugian Bolsatsu, the Bohitsvada of the universal virtue, flying westward into the clouds on a white elephant, was like a dream long lost through ages. Lost, that is, until the Edo denizens figured out how to decode the story and revive it by appropriating it into their own everyday life. Their innate talent for creative adaption and parodic inversion came to them so naturally that it never even occurred to them that they had stumbled on the intelligible workings of a profound wisdom that was simultaneously the secret art of living. Had they somehow known that future generations would take from them only leftover traces of elaborate verbal artifice and empty technical conceits, they would have just shrugged and said, fine by us. It's their loss if they can't see with our double vision. But the fact remains that their innate wisdom was entirely lost on the obtuse critics of later generations. Sadly, our literary establishment has never regarded the popular legend of Otake Dainichi Nyorai as anything more than raw material for senryu, comic, haiku, doggerel, and so many a later critic has made display of his own homespun brand of critical acumen by doing his best to denigrate it. We shouldn't, of course, take such judgments so seriously. In the senryu poem quoted in the epigraph, one finds the phrase, gold-leafed curly hair all of frizzle. Hakutsuki no chi jire gami. On the surface, the phrase clearly refers to Dainichi Ryorai's high, curled, and gilded coif. Yet the term Hakutsuki also denotes bona fide, certified, genuine, and so forth. Taken all together, the bona fide, certified, genuine girl with gold leafed curly hair, the phrase likely alludes to the popular Edo period belief that curly haired girls were more lustful than girls with straight hair. Hence, it might be helpful to consider the following lines from Eguchi, which describe the chief harlot of Eguchi's erotic nature. Konata mo nani o irogo no mi no ie ni wa sashi mo uegi no hito shirenu koto no mi ooki yado ni. Known as a woman of pleasure, she harbored in her house forgotten troubles, wanton secrets, disowned by all. In the secret cant of Edo, a promiscuous woman incapable of refusing a male suitor was called biwa yoto or low cot leaf tea likening her to the readily available decoction widely prescribed by physicians of the day. Otake was herself no doubt one such de decoction, yet the name Otake doesn't refer to this particular housemaid of the Sakumas. By no means was she the only Otake in Edo. In fact, nearly every kitchen in the city had its own little Otake, each of whom felt compelled from time to time to provide a little salvation. Saido, to the ailing young men of the city. What I'm getting at is that this naughty little maid of the Edo legend was herself none other than the Mitate stand-in for that Heian period prostitute, the Eguchi-born harlot immortalized in classical literature. And just when we are about to despair at the depths to which this poor, paltry, and frail woman has sunk, we shift into the second half of the play. And this little otake of ours is now transformed before our eyes into the... Nochijite, heroine, the ghost of that ancient prostitute of Eguchi, her kitchen now for the famed transient dwelling that the wandering monk Saigyo stumbled upon one rainy night in the 12th century. The fleeting borrowed shelter, Kari no Yado, that in poem 979 of the Shinkokin Wakashu, a new collection of poems ancient and modern, 1206, the prostitute of Eguchi coyly refused to Saigyo. Yo itou, hito to shikikeba kari no yado ni kokoro tomu na to omou bakari zo. Hearing that you are one who shuns the world of love, I worry lest you dwell upon this fleeting, borrowed shelter. Otake's kitchen shelter is also the kari no yado, or temporary refuge, that the prostitute, in the voice of the chorus, sings of in Kanami's no play. After all this clinging, I cling to no refuge as my own. Then announcing, having come thus far, now I shall return to whence I came i.e. Eastern Paradise. Otake Eguchi is transformed once again in the blink of an eye, this time into a Bohitsva Fugen, riding astride a white elephant into the setting sun. And no sooner has this departing figure faded into the discourse than Otake returns to her original form, 
and some visitor comes knocking on her back door. No doubt one of her regulars seeking another dose of her famed salvation. We might even say that this wandering libertine is none other than a mitate stand-in for that 12th century itinerant monk, Saigyo. It would be pointless for us to try to glean some philosophical message from this multi-layered urban legend from the Edo period. It wouldn't be of much use to point out that the Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination which says that everything in the universe is interrelated and interpenetrating, is at work here. You see, the Edoites were much more adept at popularizing Zokuka, old canonical styles and poems, than they were at philosophical speculation or literary analysis. For them, the notion that there could be canonical stories and poems devoid of any symbolic correlation to their own quotidian lives was unthinkable, and this is why they have been condemned by modern critics as being devoid of thought, lacking intellectual content. Mushiso. With the otake legend, we can make out how this zokuka operation works specifically on two distinct levels. On one level, it functions as a conversion device no shikake, that transforms the historical prostitute of Eguchi into the historical contemporary figure of Otake, who is the former's quotidian symbol. At another level, it functions as a kind of Buddhist mandala painting, or shape-shifting visual representation that shows the image of Otake when our eyes are open and the dainichi nyorai when our eyes are closed. Put simply, through the tableau, the humble scullion called Otake is transformed to the universally symbolic figure of the dainichi nyorai herself, albeit in yatsushi disguise. It follows, then, that the Otake as dainichi nyorai legend as a whole is a disguised yatsushi version of the Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination. In the moment the Edo poets applied this working hypothesis to all aspects of their life, it took firm root and started to grow, having already been authenticated long ago by the old anecdotal tale of the prostitute of Edguchi. While the busybody scholar will no doubt scrawl down the true story of maid Otake, and the greedy Montback will organize an installation show to peddle Otake's holy relics in some disused shed, the true meaning of this operation, called Zoukuka, or making common in the context of Edo culture, however, loses its value the moment it is wrestled from the system of relations I have just described. That is why, at the same time, the close relation between the notion of yatsushi, i.e. disguising something lofty and sacred as something low or common, and the artistic practice thereof will start to show its vitality only when it refuses to distance itself from the negotiations outlined above. But this whole notion of yatsushi disguised into a broader literary context, we might understand it as one type of haikai transformation. Haikai ka. It is precisely the various techniques and methods of haikai transformation that run through all forms of Edo life. Laborers of spirit, the Edoites forged a culture that would come to defy all subsequent systems of critical discussion. When the myopic modern critics endeavor to account for the whole of Edo culture by using some newfangled, ready-made literary theory, it easily evades their grasp. For it is the Edoites, you see, and not as most modern scholars have assumed their descendants, who deserve to be labeled modern. Whether you approach the matter from the perspective of an expert historiographer engaging in textual research, or sneak your way in as a dabbling dilettante, you are bound to lose your way inside their labyrinth. The fleeting shadow of their literature you see is simply too swift for the rummaging scholar to apprehend. Their sensibilities were far too lofty for the fashionable half-drunk writers of later ages. It may be helpful to formulate some tenuous hypothesis to clarify the basic of their eccentric nature, though at this point we must be ready to admit that any and all such mythological preconceptions will only lead us astray, forcing us to reassess their supposed usefulness. So let us put aside, for now, questions of spirit and postpone inquiries into questions of intellectual or ideological concepts. Shiso. So that we may focus instead on the specific creative techniques that have proved so evasive. The lowbrow comic form of haiku known as senyu, senryu, despite the clumsiness of its craft, shares some features with other popular forms of haikai. Yet these features have become so degraded after mixing with the lowland dust that the form can no longer be salvaged into the net of literature. The conventional wisdom of later generations indoctrinated us into believing that the only school within the various haikai movements of the Edo period with any truly free spirit and soul-transferring transcendental value was the so-called shoufu, style of Matsuo Basho's high orthodox school of haikai and its extension. I should note that extension, by the way, is always a euphemism for decline. The sterile wisdom that held the haikai poetry of Edo, in particularly the movement known as kyoka, or madcap verse, belonged on the same low level as senryu drek. But this, of course, to confuse the, but this is, of course, to confuse the wheat with the chaff. The strange evolutionary logic of Haikai's transformation course did not run in a straight line along the 53 stations of the Tokaido Road from Basho's end to Yosabusan's Kyoto. Rather, its movement was sparked in the Edo streets, 
by the ordinary denizens who inherited this haikai tradition and carried it to even greater heights through the formal literary innovations of kyoka poetry in the Tenmei era. However else we might define it, the kyoka of the Tenmei era was totally unlike the kyoka of other eras in terms of the actual literary products. Those who hold the common view that the history of kyoka began in the Kansai region of Osaka and Kyoto in the early Edo period and then later relocated to the Edo metropolis tend to start with genealogy, making all sorts of tendious distinctions between the playful Gishoka, comic poems of the Manyoshu, the 10,000 leaves, 756, and the Haikai poems of the Kokin Wakushu, a collection of poems, ancient and modern, circa 905, between concepts like the serious and the non serious varieties of Renga linked poetry, as well as the relation between the Kakinomoto Hitomaro, schools of Waka poets, and the much later Kurinomoto, school of Kyoka poets, and so on and so forth. Then, after much hang wringing over this imagined relationship between Tenmei poets and those supposed ancestors, they finally conclude by pulling out something by say, the moon-mad monk Gyogetsubo, whom they regard as the founder of Kyoka poetry. But even supposing this standard family tree explanation enhances our understanding of the origins and significance of Kyoka poetry in general, it still tells us nothing about the singular nature of the haikai literary movement of the Tenmei era, a movement that, in fact, made a radical break in terms of technique with all the methods of pre-existing poteries in the early Edo period. Kyoka poetry often makes use of the well-known technique called honkadori, or elusive variation to a classical model. Yet, for some reason, very few, if any, of the kyoka poems that simply employ honkadori are distinguished. Here's one example from Ota Nanpo's anthology, Manzai Kyokashu, Mad Poems of 10,000 Generations, written by Yamate no Shirohito, which is no exception. Kashi wa mochi, nara zakaya, kono te ni mochi shi, kashi wa mochi, ura omote yori sasurite zoku. Rice cake wrapped in oat leaf. On Narazaka slope, I finger her moist rice cake wrapped in oak leaf. In and out before partaking with relish. This technique of ribald allusion to an older canonical waka was by no means an invention of the Tenmei era. In fact, in the same Mad Poems of 10,000 Generations, hereafter Mad Poems, we found this one by Yu Choro, the so called father of modern Kyoka, written over two centuries earlier in the 16th century. But this is a world filled with lies and deceit. It's the Kanazuki month, but still, the god of poverty won't leave me alone. Yuchiro's poem is obviously an elusive variation on the famous love poem in the Kokin Wakushu, hereafter Kokinshu, poem 712. If only this were a world without deceit, how pleasant would it be to listen to your words? A honkadori poem renders into comic haikai and earlier canonical Japanese waka. This particular method of haikai transformation existed well before the Tenmei era. In fact, there were even private collections of kyoka poetry being put out well before the Tenmei era. But where does one look to find a kyoka anthology that is in itself a honkadori, vis-a-vis -vis a haikai transformation, haikaika, of not just a few lines, but rather the anthology in its entirety? In other words, where can one find an anthology of kyoka poetry that corresponds both tonally and stylistically to an entire canonical anthology and is not simply the result of a little superficial tinkering. The fact is there isn't a single one, or at least not until the Mad Poems appeared in the Tenmei era. To what canonical anthology then does Nampo's Mad Poems correspond both in terms of poetic tone and poetic style? I should probably cite, as a good empirical scholar would, some exemplary works by the three great kyoka poets of Tenmei, Ota Nampo, Akira Kanko, and Karakoromo Kishu. In order to show you precisely how their poems relate to the said canonical anthology, but I haven't the time nor space for that here. Thus, I am obliged to abridge my testimony and hasten to my assertion, namely that the imperial anthology to which Nampo's mad poems correspond is none other than the Kokinshu, and that mad poems is none other than a haikaiization. Hence, it can be said that Tenmei Kyoka was the very first movement in the entire history of Japanese poetry, and not just in the history of Kyoka, that at its core constituted a major movement that sought to resuscitate and transform the very spirit of the Kokinshu.
Does this mean then that we should view the Tenmei Kyoka movement as an extension, again a euphemism for decline, of the Kyoka poetry of much earlier precursors in Edo such as Ishida Mitoku, Nakarai Bokuyo, and others, or perhaps as an offshoot of the Kyoka poetry of Nagata Teiryu, Teihakudo Gofu, and the other coteries of the Kamigata region of Kyoto and Osaka. Once again, I am compelled to forego an empirical investigation and rush to my conclusion, namely that neither is the case. For what we find in the 12 year span between the Genroku, 1688 to 1704, and Kyoho, 1716 to 1736, eras is a blank gap or vacuum of tremendous significance from the standpoint of the history of the Edo Kyoka poetry. This gap seems to make little sense at first. Little sense, that is, until you realize just what was so quintessentially haikai like about Tenmei Kyoka in the first place. It is widely known that an unprecedented and unforeseen event occurred in the Edo metropolis nearly a century prior to the Tenmei era, an accidental mishap wholly without parallel in the history of Japanese poetry, which would forever alter the history of the haikai movement. The epoch-making event was Basho's invention of haikai-linked verse. Haikai Renga in the Gen Roku era. It goes without saying that I am not referring to Basho's dainty one-liners called Hoku or Haiku. The Basho school of poetry was able to make this remarkable artistic breakthrough by drawing on the numerous comic techniques of the highbrow poets of the medieval dojo school of Renga, namely the techniques of Haikai transformation, Haikaika, rendering serious Renga into comic Haikai. In retrospect, it seems almost inevitable that the Haikai movement, blessed with Basho's extraordinary invention, would go on to make even more astonishing advancements a century later in the Tenmei era. But once Genroku Haikai had been designated as the elegant and standard orthodoxy, Tenmei Kyoka was left to become the vulgar zoku, and eccentric ki, heterodoxy. Yet the route by which the Haikai movement proceeded from Matsuo Basho to Ota Nampo was by no means one of decline. Rather, it too was a process of zokuka or popularization. The real decline was to occur instead among Basho's epigons. If we are to be fair in our use of the term zokuka, we must emphasize the process of popularizing an Edo haikai should be seen not merely as a shift in fashion from the one-line hoku of basho to those of takarai kikaku. Rather, it is a profound and radical break in aesthetic sensibility that occurred in the nine decades between basho's major anthology, The Monkey Straw Raincoat, Sarumino in 1691, and Nampo's Mad Poems in 1783. This drastic shift in poetic sensibility reflects precisely the inexorable logic of haikai. Just as the Kyoka poetry of Tenmei differed in sensibility from that of all previous eras, so too did the Tenmei poets' attitudes towards their own authorial personae differ radically from those of their predecessors. Every Kyoka poet has his own Kyome or Kyoka alias. This is true not only of Tenmei Kyoka poets, but also of all Kyoka poets. What was entirely new about the Tenmei poets, however, was that for the first time in Kyoka history, we saw a complete transformation in the meaning of those comic aliases or Kyome. Previously, a mad Kyoka poet's mad alias differed little from the elegant pen name of the typical bunjin, literai, or the haikai pen name of the typical haikai poet, in the sense that each pen name compromised a fixed public persona. Yumei Jinkaku, a readily recognizable celebrity identity. The poets of Tenmei, by contrast, had no such fixed identities or personalities, no intrinsic names, no true selves. In fact, they themselves were absent from their multiple aliases, such each invented for a different occasion. They were non-personas. Mumei Jinkaku, devoid of any fixed persona or identity. In other words, the Tenmei poets were Yomibito shirazu, or poems without identifiable authors. If the previous haikai linked verse of Matsuo Basho had made us forget the presence of the author at the moment of its conception, the deranged compilers of mad poems took this logic even one step further by pri privileging self-concealment over self-expression, and thereby constructing a whole universe upon the renunciation of authorial name upon the renunciation of fixed essential identity. When it's a poem's mad stage name, his kyome, rather than the poet himself, playing tricks on you, the reader, you're left only to clutch vainly at mere shadows, as the poet himself is nowhere to be found. In order to drive home this simple point, I would have to write a series of biographical sketches explaining the myriad complexities and contradictions in the lives of these Tenmei poets. I would have to explain, for instance, how the position of Otanampo vis-a-vis Tenmei Kyoka corresponds to that of Matsuo Basho vis-a-vis Genroku Haikai, and how Nampo's position as compiler of the Mad Poems anthology corresponds to Kino Tsurayuki's position as compiler of the Kokinshu imperial anthology, and so forth. But it goes beyond drawing biographies and parallels. The self-actualizing phenomenon that we call Otanampo or Shokusan was in itself a sort of haikaiization, haikaika, of the two previous literary phenomenon called Matsuobasho and Kino Tsurayuki. 
From the Meiji period on, the typical reader knew only how to bite off one or two famous single line hoku from the more well known haikai sequences of the now distant basho and read these as the direct and isolated expressions of the poet himself. A rather base way of reading literature, if you ask me, which we seem to have imported from those pursuit Westerners who were never much interested in anything beyond the author and his work. What gave rise to this attitude? It's as though they needed proof of a divine creator to be certain that the world exists. When viewed through such an author centric lens, the so called mad literature, kyobungaku, of the Tenmei era becomes gibberish. Our eyes fail to see what is really going on in the works. The fact of the matter is that Tenmei Kyoka was not the work of individual poets. It was a collective movement. And poets were not individual personalities. They were pure fabrications or thought experiments, postulated beings rather than fixed selves. When we peek inside their aliases to see what's there, we find only an empty shell. And the fact that generations of scholars have consistently failed to grasp this shows just how successful these mad Tenmei poets were in beguiling us. I can almost see them now rolling around in their graves, reveling in the predicament they have put us in. A brief anecdote. In the early years of the Bunka era, from 1804 to 1818, Otanampo's successor as Haikai judge, or Hanja, Shikatsube Magao, sought to increase his tenure earnings by pushing the view that madcap Kyoka poetry, which he saw as originating in the Kokinshu, should be merged into a more mainstream and profitable domain of Haikai. He even proposed changing the name Kyoka to the more marketable term Haikai Uta, meaning simply uh, Haikai poetry. Perhaps it was this attempt to merge the two genres into one single homogenous genre that brought the value of Kyoka poetry and its poets plummeting down following the Bunsei era. It's a testament to the the singular nature of Tenmei Kyoka that the movement its successors exposed their small, feeble selves and shedding their pen names narrowed the parameters of their art. The free and luminous world that the Tenmei poets had hitherto inhabited suddenly vanished in a poof, leaving in its wake only a ragtag band of sordid exhibitionists and their second-rate merchandise. In my view, we might come to a better understanding of the real value of haikai poetry as a whole if we also included in our survey the heterodox literary movement of Tenmei Kyoka rather than limiting ourselves solely to the high orthodox school of Matsuo Basho and his epigons. If the Kyoka poets of Tenmei heartily imbibed from the old lowbrow zappai verse of traditions of Edo and Kyoto, they also ingested a certain constituent ingredient from pre Genroku Hakkai that Basho had discounted, namely koke, or humor, with which the Chinese word hakai was originally synonymous. Yet it was not only the lyrical humor of experimental works like mad poems that resonated so deeply with Edoites. In fact, looking over the poems of this collection, I see now that many of them are downright sad. You see, it was never set in stone that the self-described mad, anonymous poets, now boisterous, now melancholy, but always at a distance from their creation, should always be a bundle of cheap laughs. As I mentioned earlier, their word was anchored in the spirit of the distance kokinshu throughout their artful deployment of their various conversation techniques of haikai. They chose the kokinshu in particular over all other anthologies because something about real life conditions on the ground required that they do so. That is, no other canonical anthology permitted their classically schooled literary sensibilities or resonated in their hearts as forcefully as this anthology did. Put simply, the kokinshu was the foundational bedrock upon which mad poems could be built and sustained, even before taking into account the ordinary audition reality of urban life in the Tenmei era. There is another classical sort related to the denizen Edoite's classical literary education that bears mentioning, and that is the Toshizen, or the selection of Tang poems. What was important for the Edoites about this collection, compiled by Li Panglong in the 16th century, was not their understanding of each individual poem per se, but rather their deep familiarity, Jikong, with the collection in its entirety. First of all, in their Education Sentimental, which were cultivated through the repeated recitation of these poems in the Japanese style of reading. These two features, close intimacy, Jikong, and emotion appeal, Joso, together produce a new satirical genre of haikai, namely kyoshi, or mad poems in the Chinese style, which was led by Edo-based Otanampo, known also as Shokusan, and Kyoto-based Hatakenaka Kansai, also known as Domiyaku-sensei, Grandmaster Copperfanes. For our purposes here, let us group this hybrid poetic genre of the Tenmei era called kyoshi, or mad poems in the Chinese style, along with the kyoka, or mad poems in the Japanese style of the same era. After all, it would make little sense to attempt to trace its paternal origins to classic Japanese sources by citing obscure exchanges such as that between the conservative Confucianists and the Yi Qing divination scholar included in the Jikin Shou Treatise of Ten Rules, circa 1252. If all we're looking for is any old poem written by a Japanese poet that evokes a sense of fukyo, or aesthetic madness, then we might as well dig up Minamoto no Shitago's autumn poems from Wakan Yoeishu, a collection of Japanese and Chinese poems for singing, circa 1013, including this one called Ominaeshi, Yellow Maiden Flower. Ominaeshi. The Ominaeshi's color is yellow, like steamed millet. 
it. It is commonly called the Jorohana, or the strumpet flower. Hearing the name, I feel the urge to exchange erotic vows. But I fear any strumpet would scorn this dotard's head, white as frost. Yet, as with Tenmei Kyoka, we need not conduct an ancestral search in order to get a sense of the hardy Bukotsu, or wind and bone style, that characterized Tenmei Kyosho. Kyoshi. This is because, in terms of family tree, Tenmei Kyoshi only bears only an accidental, superficial resemblance to later Kyoshi written between Bunsei and Meiji. Hence, I see no need for further explanation. This wind and bone style that characterizes Tenmei Kyoshi can also be seen in the Genkai, or vernacular renditions of the selection of Tang poems. In fact, these rugged retellings were more than just simple yomikudashi glosses of classical Chinese poems intended to help average readers make sense of the difficult poem. Rather, they themselves were a kind of hybrid translations that enacted parodic trans reversals of the original Tang poems. For example, here's one such Genkai in the form of a Kyoshi that satirically reworks of a famous poem from the Tang dynasty. The Kyoshi is by Otanampo, titled Letter to the Lovely Hanaogi of the Gomeiro Ogia House. Letter to the Lovely Hanaogi of the Gomeiro Ogia House. Led by the famed Hanaogi to her scented bedchamber, on the fifth day I said goodbye near the great gate. If, in her quarters, she asks when we will meet again, simply answer, my smitten heart in this jaded verse. Nampo's Kyoshi is clearly a parody of Wang Changming's Seeing Off Jinjiang at Hibiscus Pavilion, a solemn Tang Dynasty poem from the 8th century about the sorrows of being exiled from home. Seeing off Shangjing at Hibiscus Pavilion. Cold rain extends the river as I enter Wu at night. Next morning, when I see off a friend, Mount Tu is lonely. If relatives and friends in Luoyang inquire after me, simply answer, I see heart in a jade face. We might describe Nampo's poem as a sort of Hon Shi Dori rather than Hongka Dori, to show it as an elusive transformation on a Chinese poem, rather than on a native Japanese waka. But Nampo's skillful parodic version on an earlier poem is more than a simple variation on a canonical Chinese model, or Hongxi. If Wang Changling's original poem from the Tang Dynasty expresses in classical style the heart-rendering nature of a lover's parting, Nampo's poem involves a surprising twist, the transformation of Wang's narrator into a would-be playboy, Suijing, visiting a brothel in the famed Edo pleasure quarters. In other words, Otanampo radically inverts the original meaning and sense of the original poem through this clever conceit, thereby creating a peculiar situation where each poem's image is reflected in the other, like two uncanny mirrors facing one another. Delighted by this unexpected shift in poetic intention and phrasing, Nampo's readers would have been moved to chills as they laughed outwardly at his clever parody while crying inwardly at Wang Tongling's original earnest expression of the pangs of love. Yet the moment Nampo's poem is removed from this context, i.e. its relation to the original Chinese poem, the art of appreciating Tenmei Kyoshi is bound to crumble. If we assume that the only poets fit to play in the world of comic poetry are those who possess the keen determination and proud spirit of a samurai, then we would weigh heavily on their hearts and minds. But if we recognize that it's not the person, but the elusive shadow of the invisible author that at some point furtively steals upon the heart of the reader with a chilling effect, then we can see that this is more than just a clever figure of speech. Indeed, there were quite a few madcap Kyoshi poets who showed considerable craft, some nearly surpassing or overshadowing even the great Shokusan himself. The artistic gifts of Kanwante Onitake, aka Hanka Sanjin, for instance, have been widely praised and the wondrous, sublime quality called Myo that suffuses his selected poems has received much acclaim. The 11th theme of the play, Chu Shingura, The Treasury of Loyal Retainers, too, is regarded in the world of Japanese theater as a dramatic climax that reveals the general lineaments of Confucianism in its starkly austere way of moral learning. Yet not even these two examples can match Domyaku Sensei's Hijoko, The Housemaid's Ballad, 1769, and so one must guard against admiring them excessively. In short, what I am trying to suggest is that by evaluating the poetry of the Edo period in isolation and only in terms of the final product, we remove ourselves from that original urgency and double vision that characterizes the Tenmei Edoite's way of seeing the world. Like Tenmei Kyoka, Tenmei Kyoshi articulated its creative genius through experimentation, disjunctive synthesis and innovation. But whereas Madcap Kyoka parodies native Japanese waka written in the native Yamato language, Kyoshi was from the start a derivative form that parodies classical Chinese poem, Kangshi, written by classical Chinese poets. In short, Kyoshi was premised on the cultural appropriation, karimono, of Chinese literature, karabito. Hence it would be foolish to jump headlong into a quibble about issues of, techn of technique and originality in its compositions, since the poems themselves exist in relation to their foundational kanshi 
poems. Honshi. Here's another piece of evidence for just how popular the selection of Tang poems was among the Edo denizens. In Santo Kyoden's comical Sharebon titled Shige Shige Chiwa, Rustle of Pillow Talk, 1790, there is an episode in which a certain hunkatsu, or half-baked sophisticate, having ventured into a brothel for the evening, waits in vain for his lover to attend him at the swinky love-making parlor, known in those days as a Nyodai Benya, or a surrogate room. At the top edge of his pillow, he finds a small folding screen bearing a few five-syllable wujue, verses scribbled in calligraphy. The twenty squarely drawn Chinese characters read, The grass at the ever-faithful palace, like her sorrow, has grown thick over the years, and now covers the elegant boot prints left by her former lover, who no more mounts the jeweled steps to her bedchamber. Wriggling his nose as if he knows the poem, Kyoden's half-su, Hankatsu hero mutters these lines to himself, making all kinds of mistakes, unable to make out most of the characters. Here's how he reads, for example, the third line, Tenku, and the fourth line, Kekku, of the quatrain. Now, uh, traces in the mm, tiptoes up the steps, uh, not calling on the servant. We might view his gross misreadings of the poem as an extreme example or parody of the kind of vernacular glosses we see in the Genkai poems I mentioned earlier. By satirizing selection of Tang poems in this scene, Kyo then clearly aimed to provoke laughter in his readers. But this succeeds only if his Shariban readers possess the requisite knowledge needed to get the joke. In other words, Kyoden must have assumed that the Shariban readers of the day would know that these 20 squarely drawn Chinese characters were taken straight from Sui Gofu's 8th century poem, Changqing Sao, The Grass of the Ever Faithful Palace. Moreover, these readers, having learned the legend of Emperor Chen of Han in his concert, Ban Jie Yu, at a young age, would have been struck with admiration at Kyoden's novel concept of superimposing the rejected widow of the ancient Han court over his spurned hero and amazed at the artful skill with which he appropriated the two into the epigraph. We can be sure that a writer as shrewd as Kyoden never would have risked embarrassing his readers with these 20 squarely drawn characters unless he was certain that they would get the reference. Now I'm rambling on about the Shadebon and its preferred topos, the famed pleasure districts of Edo. But to be honest, I've actually been furtively mulling over something else, roving further away from the Kyoka poetry of the Tenmei era and from the comical Sharebon of the Santo Kyoden towards the subject of Ninjobon, that late Edo genre of sentimental fiction that survived into the modern age. This subject is also related to the idea of the pleasure quarters and commercial love, that ultimate invention of the Edo imagination. It is precisely followed by this thread, which led us from the popular urban legend of the Otake Dainichi Nyorai to this singular notion of the pleasure quarters, that we can begin to see how the Edoites' way of thinking developed. But more on this some other day. Okay, Nicole, thank you for the wonderful reading of a very, very difficult text, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the most important work of literary criticism of the 20th century, in my view, and we will discuss, there's a lot to unpack there, it's, uh, a lot of it is unclear, and uh, just imagine how much more difficult it is in the original Japanese, hopefully my translation is a bit uh, easier to read, obviously, for natives, but for even for Japanese readers as well. Um, we will discuss the details of the work in class. I will see you all then. Thank you, Nicole, for the wonderful reading. Goodbye. You can edit out my all oh, right there. You can edit out my all oh, right there. <coughs> Part of the be, 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 uh, sort of um. <coughs> In the secret cant of Ido. A little bit. It's a bit embarrassing. It's like a. Have you ever? Have you ever seen Radio Rebel? You should watch Radio Rebel. It's a similar situation. No, you're not. This is all gonna be edited out later. I worry. <laughs> ah! Hot. Sim bleh. When it's a poem's mad stage name, Kyomei, rather than the poet himself. Wait, I already I just read that one. Edo Den. In the middle of what I'm reading. <laughs>